Well, good morning, evening, and afternoon to all our online viewers, wherever you may be. My name is Russell Shao. I am the executive director of the Global Taiwan Institute. GTI is a 501c3 think tank based in Washington, D.C., dedicated exclusively to Taiwan policy research and related programs. Our mission is to enhance the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed discussion about Taiwan and its people. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. They include a biweekly publication called the Global Taiwan Brief, public seminars, an annual symposium in the fall, scholarships and fellowship opportunities, podcasts, as well as cultural programs. If you're not already subscribed to receive our updates, you may do so by visiting our website at www.globaltaiwan.org. I would like to thank our co-founders, directors, staff and interns who make all our programs possible. So let's begin today's program. I'm truly delighted to be hosting today's conversation with uh, Ryan Haas about his book, Stronger, Adapting America's China Strategy in an Age of Competitive Interdependence. Today's conversation is especially timely given the ongoing China debates happening here in DC and surely in other capitals throughout the world. It is also timely because the topic of his book is particularly well suited to follow our previous discussion in GTI's book talk series, where we featured Elbridge Colby, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development, where he discussed China's best military strategy and how the United States should plan to defeat it. Today, we will shift gear and discuss with Ryan Haas how he thinks the United States can manage the relationship and prevent conflict with China. I think we've all been hearing a lot from officials and think tank experts alike in recent years when describing the fate of US-China relations that competition need not lead to conflict. And I think with his book, Ryan makes a thoughtful and pragmatic effort to propose a framework for how to navigate the challenging terrain ahead. Ryan brings a wealth of professional expertise to untangle these difficult questions. And he does so with exceptional nuance in his diagnosis of the nature of the existing state of affairs and also offering a set of both prescriptive and proscriptive guidance for where it should go. He does this with a refreshing self-reflecting perspective as well to ensure that, these, that this competition does not go off the rails. Ryan is a senior fellow uh, and the Michael H. Armacost Chair in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, where he holds a joint appointment to the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. He's also the Chen Fu and Cecilia Yen Ku Chair in Taiwan Studies. From 2013 to 2017, Ryan served as a director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council staff, and prior to that as a foreign service officer at U.S. Embassy Beijing. I want to remind our live audience members that we do want to hear from you and we'll be taking questions from you. Um, we will reserve around 15 minutes at the end of the session to uh, take your questions. You may submit your questions by sending an email to contact at globaltaiwan.org. Again, that is contact at globaltaiwan.org. You can use the chat function on the YouTube page. Uh, you may also tweet us. Uh, um, on Twitter at, at Global Taiwan. Do you please include your name and an affiliation. Uh, those that do will be prioritized in the um, in this session. So, uh, Ryan, welcome. Thank you, Russell. It's uh, wonderful to be with you. And I just want to start out by expressing my admiration for the tremendous work that the Global Taiwan Institute does. Uh, you guys have have grown and and established so much influence so quickly, and uh, it's a tribute to to you and your team's great work. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, let's jump right in. <clears throat> so I'd like to begin these book talks always with giving our, uh, the, our, our, the author an opportunity to, um, you know, to explain what, why they wrote the book that they did and, and what motivated them to do so. So, Ron, over to you. Well, Russell, I, I think that it may be obvious at this point that uh, I did not write the book to become rich or famous. Um, I think it was Bob Woodward that says that, that fear sells. Uh, this book is the opposite. Uh, it's arguing that the United States should have confidence uh, rather than fear. But I, I think that, that fear has been a dominant 
thread of discussion in Washington about China lately. And it's not just an idea, uh, an issue confined to the ideas industry. There's a joke within the De Department of Defense as well that if you really need funding for a project, add the word China to the title. And if it's absolutely essential, add artificial intelligence on top of it and you're guaranteed. So I, I mentioned that in jest. The, the point I'm trying to make is that there's been a lot of sort of monochromatic uh, monochromatic discussion about uh, uh, China for a while. And uh, to break out in this type of environment, you need to say something that's even more frightening or flashy than, than everyone else. So the, the incentive structure uh, uh, points towards, uh, towards, you know, selling fear. My view is that uh, it was important for someone to stand up and say that the United States is and still remains by a significant margin the, the stronger power in the U.S.-China relationship. And we should remember that. We should act like it rather than reactively and defensively um, responding to every Chinese action everywhere in the world without regard to whether it, it implicates our, our vital interests or not. My, my view is that we're not going to be able to change China uh, any more than we've changed Cuba or Venezuela, Syria, Iraq or Afghanistan. But China is also not going to change us. We're both going to be two strong, powerful, proud countries uh, in the international system. So we're going to have to find a confident course for navigating this, this thorny relationship with China, uh, one that allows us to have a certain degree of calm and perspective and to try to resist you know, anxiety and fear. Uh, I, just as, as one final note, I wrote the book in 2019 and 2020. Uh, while the presidential primaries were underway, it was unclear uh, who would be in office in, in 2021. The, the goal, I guess, if, if there was one, was to try to provide uh, a bit of grist for whoever the incoming team would be to be able to take a step back and, and think about and think through the long term competitive dynamic of the US China relationship rather than, than having to feel like it's a immediate crisis requiring reflexive reactions. That, that's a great answer, Ryan. Um, and so uh, let's so let's dive into the book here. I mean, really, the the central organizing concept of your book is this uh, this concept of competitive interdependence right and this is where you really sort of you know uh, dive into the, uh, the 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 debates about what are what's supposed to be the um, you know definitive features of the US China relationship so how do you distinguish then this concept of competitive interdependence with other uh, now more prevailing concepts if you will um, such as strategic competition and great power competition, which is you know prevalent in our discourse today about right. uh, the relationship. Right. Well, Russell, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think that great power competition has become the the prevailing sort of frame uh, through which many people look at the U.S.-China relationship. the The idea of competitive interdependence is intended to be a, a modest departure uh, from that, and and I'll explain what I mean. I think that the drumbeat incantations of competition, we need to compete with China, we need to compete with China, they're fine. The, the relationship is inherently competitive. It's going to continue to be inherently competitive. But focusing exclusively on competition as the only organizing principle of American policy hasn't, hasn't led China to liberalize its political or economic model, hasn't led them to become more responsive to American concerns. To a certain extent, by having such a narrow view of the relationship, what we've done is cause Beijing to conclude that there is no room for improvement in the relationship. There is nothing to be gained from moderation. And as a result, Beijing just needs to gird for the long-term struggle with the United States that, uh, that awaits. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of competitive interdependence is to try to help distinguish, help us distinguish between those issues that are zero sum in nature uh, in the U.S.-China relationship versus those that are positive or negative sum. In other words, issues where the United States and China will both either be positively or negatively affected by uh, the, the direction of events. And as I, as I mentioned, at its core, this idea acknowledges that the relationship is inherently competitive. After all, we have different governance and, and economic systems. We have different views and visions for the regional and global order. And there are issues like Taiwan, uh, where there is no room for compromise. We just have fundamentally different interests that are at odds with each other. But to stop the analysis of the relationship there is to miss a big piece of the picture of, of the actual relationship. The, the reality is that alongside this intense competition, there is a thick interdependence. There is over a half trillion dollars of trade each year uh, between each country, and that trade is going up, not down. Uh, there is uh, deep in integrated knowledge production between the west coast of the United States and the east coast of China. 
And there's also just the inescapable reality that there is ecological interdependence between our two countries. Uh, we're both stuck on the same planet, whether we like each other or not. And we're both going to be impacted by, by climate change, by pandemics, by, by a whole host of other issues. And so the, this, is a, this is intended to be a framing device, not a silver bullet solution. Uh, it doesn't solve any of the problems in the relationship, but hopefully it helps us understand uh, the, the dynamics at play. Yeah, no, um, you know, you can be sure that we'll we'll get into the Taiwan uh, policy discussions uh, later. Um, uh, but I want to stick with, uh, you know, I think a very pointed observation that's related to the, the remarks that you, you just made with regards to the interdependent component part of the relationship. And, and you describe in your book, um, and I think somewhat, you know, in a, in a manner of speaking, somewhat counterintuitively, uh, in in terms of how it's framed in our, our our ongoing discussions about how our efforts to compete with China has been focused on weakening China, but that these office uh, these efforts are also weakening you know the U.S. as well, and and so so can you explain the ways you see this sort of uh, you know sort of uh, playing out in your view and 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 how 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 that's the case. Well, sure. I mean, I'll I'll start out with a specific example, and then I'll try to provide a broader observation. I. The, the relationship that I'm trying to describe is one where it's really hard for one side to punch the other without feeling hit itself in the process. And to, to just offer an example, look at the trade war that uh, the United States and China went through. Uh, it was a colossal failure, period. Uh, even the supporters of President Trump that I've had an opportunity to speak with in the heartland of America when I travel throughout the country will acknowledge that the, the trade war failed, but they will add the caveat that it felt good, uh, you know, that China deserved it. So the, the, the trade war itself was premised upon the notion that, that China needed to be knocked down and that the, if the United States applied enough muscle and, and put enough energy into the effort, it could make China bend to America's will. And I think that the approach was built, just to be blunt about it, on a fundamental ignorance of President Xi Jinping's political calculus. You know, he has a political brand. Uh, that he's developed over the past decade for being strong and not bowing to external pressure. And each time that President Trump talked about how he was winning or would win uh, the trade war, he made the realization of that goal uh, further and further away. And let's look at what happened. The, the net result. We all experienced, every family in America experienced a, a tax increase of about $1,200 through the, the cost of tariffs that were passed on to consumers. Over 300,000 jobs were estimated to have been lost. Several uh, points were shaved off of our GDP. There was a wave of farm foreclosures throughout the United States and suicides, and sadly, that followed it. But the point is that the trade war, it did not change China's economic system. It did not puncture China's economic growth. It did not reduce the trade deficit, and it did not deliver benefits to the American economy. So it's, it's really sort of a case study in the point that I'm trying to make of how not to conduct uh, American policy toward China. Now, the broader observation that I would just offer uh, for your and our audience's reaction is that diplomacy is the art of achieving progress. That's the goal. Uh, the United States doesn't get to enjoy uh, absolute victory over other countries. The last time that we did was at the end of World War II uh, when Germany and Japan you know, faced situations of absolute surrender. Absent that, in every instance between now and, and then and now, we've had to accept incremental progress, making making gains where gains are possible. And uh, and you know part of the work that I'm trying to do through this book is to reorient us to the practical, pragmatic realities of an interest-based approach to dealing with China. Mm. Well, okay, then let's pull that thread. You know, uh, in terms of what the approach should be, it strikes me that you know the differences that you just outlined with regards to the objectives and the means by which the former administration approaches China policy. Uh, was uh, uh, ill-advised by, I think, again, the mismatch of objectives and, and, and means. So, so what are then, uh, well, what should be America's top objectives uh, with China and more broadly Asia as well? And I think they're they are obviously very much um, interrelated, I would say. Um, so how, what, what would you, how would you, uh, what, what should America's top objectives be with China and Asia? Well, I, I guess I would start out with, uh, the security side of things. I think it's absolutely essential for the United States to deter China from challenging the credibility of America's security commitments, both to our allies, but I would also add Taiwan. Uh, I think it's essential for us to encourage China to assume greater responsibility for global challenges, commensurate with its role and its strength in the international system. 
Uh, I think that we certainly want to push China to open up its markets to, to foreign competition to allow greater access for, for American firms. But we also, just by the nature of who we are as a people, I think that we want to continue to push China to exhibit greater respect for the, the rights and values of its people. Um, the goal as I see it, and this is obviously a contested uh, topic, so I'll just share my thoughts. So the, the, the goal is that we want to try to channel China's growing power into areas that do not instigate conflict with us, uh, but that potentially could help relieve the burden that the United States faces to, to deal with some of the global challenges that we both confront. Mm -hmm. And these global challenges that you speak of uh, suggest that this, this framework that you're proposing, competitive interdependence, is is what will help preserve the exist the, the sort of international order that we're in so what what then do you think are going to be i mean what are you going to be what's going to be the the, the trade-offs you know for to preserve this international system that uh, that 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 you know that's been built after uh, world war ii yeah i i'm not sure that there will be any immediate trade-offs um I, I wouldn't advise uh, any president to, you know, go to Beijing with dramatic concessions uh, in hopes that it will elicit future Chinese support for revisions to the international order. Um, I also don't think that we're going to uh, preserve and uphold the international order by trying to uh, fortify it at the expense of and in an exclusion of conversations with China. China needs to be uh, a part of this conversation, but it shouldn't be in a G2 format where it's the United States and China, the, the two big kids sitting at the table while everyone else watches. That would be corrosive to our alliance relationships uh, throughout the region and the world. It needs to be somewhere in between. And I, I guess I would start from the premise that we are in the midst of the greatest power transition in, in the international system, probably since the 1850s. Uh, you know, 60% of global GDP is in Asia, much of uh, the global economic growth is going to come from Asia. Uh, just looking at China in 2000, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, it, it was 12% of America's GDP. Now it's around 71%. So whether we like it or not, there is a power transition underway. Uh, and the international order is going to have to adapt uh, to the fact that, uh, that the real center of gravity in the international system for the rest of the century will probably be in Asia. And as a result, a lot of the conversations about up upgrading and upholding the international order are going to have to be inclusive of and embedded in in uh, in conversations, including stakeholders in the region in Asia. Um, the the other final thought that I would offer, Russell, is that the United States and China, uh, you know, neither side is going to be particularly eager to be seen as supporting the other's initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, United States isn't going to support the Belt and Road Initiative. China is not going to support, uh, you know, Build Back Better World. It, this is this is just a reality. And so, if if we're going to have meaningful, constructive conversations about uh, upgrading and renovating the international system, it's probably going to have to be embedded in regional and global organizations in which both the United States and China are a member. That will provide both a space and a veneer for both sides to to come together through these conversations, while the United States can do so sitting alongside its allies and partners. That's uh, that's a very um, uh, uh, really well thought out answer, uh, Ryan. Um, you know, I think one component part of this uh, broader sort of uh, uh, equation that we haven't really uh, gotten into yet, though, is really uh, what China's aspirations are here. And I think you noted earlier that you know um, about uh, Xi Jinping's political cal calculus and and his and his sort of um, uh, vision um for the uh for the world order and you know and and, it's, and i think a lot of people would argue that you know um you know the actions taken even by the former administration um you know were a response to china's uh behaviors and and, and the need to respond to those um you know so so i think maybe for, to try to get to the er, er, earlier point that you made about um xi jinping's political calculus uh, and, and and weaving that into really uh, the role that China's aspirations play in how the future of this international order will will shake out, um, you know, and and you described also in your in your book about uh, and I think you know clearly that uh, and I think accurately uh, that it is a highly strategic revisionist power. Um, I'd like you to elaborate on that and kind of weave that into the uh, to the just discussion that we that you've been you know that we started with. Uh, with uh, with how to preserve the international system and, and do so 
when you know when when China is this highly strategic revisionist power and and Xi Jinping's uh, you know calculus as well. Right. Right. Well, look, I, there are a range of views, as you know, in Washington on, on China's overall ambitions. On, on one end of the spectrum, there are people who argue that, that China's goals are largely defensive, largely domestic. They're trying to preserve the, the Chinese Communist Party's grip on power. On, on the other end of the spectrum, I think there's an argument that, that China has um, sweeping global ambitions to displace the United States, to become the, the world's dominant power and then to impose its vision and its values on the rest of the world. I guess I would fall somewhere in the middle on that spectrum. Um, I, I think that, that China does want to be the leading power in Asia and a leading power on the world stage. Why wouldn't they? That's, uh, I think that's their, their, their self-identity, their view of themselves historically. I think that they, they definitely want their political and economic system to be respected and treated as legitimate. And uh, the more, that other countries adopt elements or aspects of their political or economic model, the more legitimized it becomes. I think they also want uh, the United States, the rest of the region, and really the world to have deference for what they term as their core interests, some of which are in direct uh, you know, challenge with America's vital interest. And so it's gonna be a bumpy road. Um, but from, from my perspective, the question isn't whether China is going to go stronger, it's how it's going to use its growing power. And um, I, I, you know, I, I expect that China will work to try to dim the attraction of liberal democracies. I expect that they will try to weaken uh, America's alliance networks. I expect that they will try to promote their view that social stability should take precedence over individual liberties. So there is going to be a lot of tension uh, built into the system. Um, and we need to we need to understand that. Uh, but we also need to have a sense of our own about what it is that we can tolerate and what it is that we cannot. And, uh, you know, from my perspective where I sit, I, I think it's absolutely essential that we ensure that China does not try to limit our access to Asia, does not try to impede our ability to enjoy freedom of, of navigation and overflight, uh, does not challenge our security commitments. Um, if they do those things, we're going to have real problems. Uh, yeah. If If they... If they stay away from them, you know, there's still a hope that we can manage uh, this increasingly intense relationship. I think some of your critics uh, or, you know, some observers would would argue that, you know, competitive interdependence seems very sort of 1990s or even sort of early 2000s in which, you know, this sort of the U.S. policy community at the time, you know, folk wrapped gripped with the, you know, the idea of multipolarity and interdependence um, and was, you know, sort of engaging in policy towards China uh, in the hopes that, you know, engagement will help transform it. And, and are we not well past that period now, uh, given what we're seeing from China in the past decade? What, what gives you hope that this is still a, a viable, viable framework for, 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 for U.S.-China relations? Well, I, I appreciate you giving me the chance to address this question because I've certainly heard um, heard this critique before. I guess what I would say is, um, if you find anywhere in the book where we talk, where I talk about convergence theory, this idea that uh, increasing trade and uh, interaction will make China more like us, let me know. It's not there. If you find anywhere in the book that talks about the need for the United States to strike a balance between cooperation and competition to maintain an equilibrium in the relationship, let me know, because it's not there. Uh, it's, this is a lazy argument, Russell, because it, it, it's, um, it's just not accurate. Uh, the book accepts that the relationship between the United States and China is fundamentally competitive, and that it will remain so into the future. Uh, it emphasizes the importance for the United States of finding its friends to deal with a increasingly revisionist, uh, ambitious China. Uh, it accepts that neither the United States nor China will be able to impose its will on the other uh, or achieve its national ambitions, really, if they have a hostile relationship with each other. The, the point I guess I'm trying to drive towards is that the United States doesn't need to defeat China to protect and advance its interests. It doesn't need to turn China into Switzerland to do so. What we need to do is deliver the goods for our people and galvanize global efforts to tackle global challenges. The United States is capable of doing those things. Uh, our advantages are things that we control, our global prestige, our international alliance network, and our domestic dynamism. If, if we nurture those strengths, we're going to be just fine in our ability to compete with China. 
A, a, an argument that uh, an essential one, I would say, and I would add uh, in how I sort of when I read your book, um, is that um, is that the U.S. policy should not seek to restrain China's rise. And, and you just er noted earlier that I think this is informed in part by by your, your view that there are limitations in U.S. ability to even to affect China's behaviors. Uh, so, but but to 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 sort of um, broaden this sort of question out a bit. How do you reconcile that sort of line of effort to not restrain China's rise because we're we really can't affect China's behaviors, um, and 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 with U.S. vital interests uh, to not allow China to to dominate Asia and 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 I think you noted earlier just as well that you know I think China aspires you know I think to be um, dominant uh, in Asia if not a hegemon a hegemon in Asia. Yeah, I, 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 I think that the China does have significant ambitions to be the leading power in Asia and a leading power on the world stage. Uh, I guess the question I would ask is how, how, how is it possible for China to do that? I don't, I don't see a path available to them. Uh, and if the United States and its allies and partners play their cards right, there won't be a path available to them. Um, if anything, I see the opposite trend occurring. Uh, where China is repeating some of the mistakes that uh, the the Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm made, you know, you'll recall that uh, as as Germany was rising in the late 19th century, Bismarck really tried to uh, reassure his neighbors that uh, that Germany had benign intentions, that it would be a peaceful rising power, and it was Kaiser Wilhelm who said, "Enough, you know, we're strong. We need to be respected and and treated with uh, with deference for our strength." I think that we're watching a certain replay uh, of, of that pattern again, uh, mm. or at least echoes of it right now. If you think back to where we were, uh, you know, a decade ago, there was a lot of talk of China's peaceful rise of, uh, you know, uh, of its benign intentions. Those days are gone. Uh, now, now the talk out of Beijing is that uh, the, the East is rising and the West is declining and it's time for everyone to just accept reality and, and defer to, to China's growing strength. Uh, and what it's happening is it's triggering the very reaction you would expect. Uh, countries in the region are bandwagoning and uh, and finding each other as a hedge against uh, uncertainty and concern about uh, about China becoming more assertive externally. And we're seeing this through the Quad, through the AUKUS agreement, through the Japan uh, Australia alignment, and and a host of other uh, minilateral and, and regional groupings. This is a response to to China's growing assertiveness. And uh, I think that there's also a growing demand for the America, America to play a larger role in the region uh, as a stabilizing force. That's good. That's what we want. And, uh, and we should lean into uh, that demand signal. Um, but to do so effectively, we're going to have to have a holistic strategy for the region, not just a security strategy for the region. Uh, you know, it's often said in jest that the business of Asia is business. And, uh, yeah. and you know, it's really incumbent upon uh, American policymakers to develop a economic strategy uh, that's fit for the moment in the region. Mm. Mm. Um, so part of the, the, an important dimension in this overall equation of competitive framework is your, is your focus on the, uh, you know, domestic side, the domestic strengths of the United States. But I think in some respects that, you know, uh, especially perceptions within the United States are, are, are seem to be changing and souring uh, towards China. Uh, and it sees it, you know, I think um, uh, more Americans are seeing China increasingly uh, more of a, uh, of a challenge, if not a threat. Um, and how does that affect your considerations about the, of, of the viability of a competitive and interdependent framework for, uh, for uh, going forward? It's a really good question, um, and I'll have to give it more thought as I, I go forward. But I, I very much accept the premise of the question that uh, that attitudes in the United States towards China are souring. Uh, a lot of Americans are feeling increasingly frustrated by Chinese behavior. I will include myself among them. Uh, you know, it does anger me. It does frustrate me what uh, what China is doing in Xinjiang, what they've done in Hong Kong, the pressure that they're applying to Taiwan. That's that affects my view as well as uh, many other uh, American voters' views. But I, I guess where I come back is that the foreign policy is largely driven by the executive branch, according to the constitutional arrangements of, you know, American democracy. And, you know, a, a weak president will allow political wins to dictate his or her uh, policy towards China. But absent that, you know, China will be uh, seen as, as the most formidable challenger by any nation state. 
but also one of many challenges that the United States confronts on the world stage. And so uh, the, the other point I guess I would just offer is that, that there are negative views towards China, uh, but if you look at uh, the intensity of those views as they relate to voting patterns, uh, China is not traditionally a high priority uh, in the priorities that are listed by voters. And so there's still a pretty high degree of latitude for, for presidents to pursue the strategy that, that they see as best suited to advancing America's interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very good answer. Um, you make the point that um, effectively managing in the book, uh, US-China relations would, and then you might, in your note earlier, require building boundaries um, around areas of potential conflict. And so I was wondering what you see as the uh, potential conflicts that are most likely and, um, and, and for the United States uh, to, to address. Yeah, I see a handful of, uh, of issues that could tip the United States and China into a conflict. Um, the, the most proximate one uh, is if China were to challenge the credibility of American security commitment. So, you know, we have alliance relationships with the Philippines and Japan and South Korea, and we have a, a strong security commitment to our friends in Taiwan. Um, so that's, that's the first. The, the second, I, I guess, would be if there was an unplanned incident that spiraled out of control. Uh, it's, it's not a state secret that uh, the crisis management mechanisms between the United States and China right now are, uh, are pretty deficient. And uh, I, I would hate to replay the EP3 incident from 2001 today and, uh, and, and see what happens because uh, I think that that would be a, a difficult situation for leaders in both capitals to manage. Um, I think that there's also, you know, real risk about the acceleration of innovation in new domains of competition, whether it's space, cyber, AI-enabled weaponry. Uh, the, the pace of innovation is exceeding uh, the ability of the United States and China and other powers to communicate around where the boundary should be set and rules of the road should be established. Uh, and then the, the other issue that we've touched on briefly in our conversation thus far is if China were to make an effort to impede America's lawful access to, to airspace or waters in Asia, uh, I think that that could also, you know, bring us to to the brink of uh, of conflict as well. So the risks are real, uh, and we can't sleep on them or assume that uh, that that they will take care of themselves. We're going to have to actively manage these problems. Mm. Let me let me, let me um, broaden that out a bit and 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 think about you know other potential um, uh, conflicts. And I think. Quite presciently, uh, presciently, you covered in your book the uh, Sino-Russian relations quite a lot, and and you proposed as the solution that it should not be to slow down their convergence. Uh, uh, it should be to slow down their convergence, but don't kind of drive a wedge. But you know, I mean, as you're as we're watching the events unfold with the with the invasion of of Ukraine and the unprecedented uh, you know a joint statement um, that they made um, you know prior to the to the Olympics, um, you also include a very interesting anecdote, um, you know, in your book from a conversation you had back in 2015 with a high-ranking CCP official about this. Um, but how, how does the war in Ukraine and Russia and China's, you know, relation growing alignment with Russia affect you know you change your calculus with regards to potential areas of conflict? Uh, and 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 um, and really, just uh, again, also with to, to the extent the a competitive interdependent framework could um, you know could actually realistically work in this sort of new area we're in. Yeah, I, it's a great question. Um, you know, my I will have to go back and reread that chapter. But uh, my my view is that crises compel prioritization. We are in the midst of a crisis right now in Ukraine. Uh, you know, 4 million refugees have fled the country and are, are spread across Europe. Thousands of civilians are, are dying. Uh, Europe's being destroyed or, or Ukraine's being destroyed by Russia's invasion, which is, uh, enjoys uh, at least tacit support from China. Um, so, so what do we do about this? Uh, I think that, that we prioritize a few things. Uh, in our communications with China right now. The first is that uh, if China were to backfill international sanctions uh, and cushion Russia's economy uh, by violating those sanctions, it will put the United States-China relationship on an entirely new tra trajectory uh, that will intensify uh, uh, confrontation and, and, uh, and push us on a very dangerous path. If China were to send arms to Russia while Russia is invading its neighbor and slaughtering innocent civilians, 
that similarly would put us on a, a very dangerous path. What we would like to see uh, China do is exercise restraint in those areas. And uh, I, I would argue also take steps to relieve human suffering. Uh, there are real things that, that China has the capacity to do now. Uh, to send humanitarian assistance, to send refugee assistance, to commit to future reconstruction of Ukraine. These are all within uh, China, China's capacity and none of them violate China's, the way that they've defined or described their own interest. And, and we should push them to do that. We should also push them to try to uh, exercise their leverage to, um, to accelerate uh, the path toward a ceasefire uh, in, in Ukraine. But at a at a more sort of conceptual level, I think what we're trying to do or what we should be trying to do is to establish a few degrees of separation uh, between China's own interests and Russian behavior. Uh, you know, it may be three, three degrees, maybe five degrees, maybe seven degrees of separation. But, you know, these 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 degrees matter. Um, but we're going to have to, I think, to get back to the, the essence of your question, have a bit of uh, patience with this. My, my general view is as long as uh, Putin and Xi are in power. Uh, the, the broad um, uh, warmth of the China-Russia relationship will remain. But we also have to have a bit of historical perspective. The, the closeness of China-Russia relations by historical standards is unnatural. There aren't really precedents in the past for this. Uh, this, is, this is a unique phenomenon uh, that I think connects to both leaders. The China and Russia have different ambitions, different identifications of our interests, different ambitions. And so uh, as time goes by, uh, I think that it will be possible to see the China-Russia relationship return to a more natural resting place than it is now. Um, but that, that will take time. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, um, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very measured uh, response. I, I'd, I'd say that, you know, in, in some respects, you know, there are a lot of uh, concerns that, you know, we are now, you know, uh, on the foothills perhaps of a new Cold War. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, a terminology, uh, it, the description that, um, you know, that uh, Henry Kissinger had also described. Um, and uh, and so, you know, there are a lot of scholars and analysts now trying to look at the Cold War to see what lessons uh, we can draw. And, and I think you also, in your book, uh, you know, uh, make references and analysis with regards to what are the sort of the proper lessons uh, we can uh, draw for, for U.S.-China relations going forward, and, and with that added element of of Russia, of course, it makes it you know a bit um, even more, um, more perhaps even more relevant. So, you know, the questions to you here is, you know, what 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 lessons should we draw from the Cold War for uh, where U.S.-China relations are now and 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 going forward? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I generally am a little allergic to Cold War analogies for describing the U.S.-China relationship today because I I worry that it does more to conceal than to clarify. Uh, and I guess part of what I mean by that is that I'm not sure that that the options that we use during the Cold War will be available to us with China going forward. In other words, you know, China has more than 100 countries around the world that consider China their largest trading partner. Uh, containing China uh, is not something the United States can do alone. And uh, at the moment, unless China makes a major provocation uh, that reorients uh, many countries sort of threat perception of China, uh, it's going to be really hard to pull other countries along into a containment of China. I don't think that it we can rely upon or depend upon the, the prospect of China collapsing the way that the Soviet Union did. And uh, heaven forbid, I don't think that we're going to uh, resolve this problem in the way that we did with World War II with uh, a war where we led to the absolute surrender of our adversary. And so we're in sort of a, a new different space in, in a certain respect, it's harder than the Cold War was more complex. Um, China, China, I think is a is a very formidable challenge to us. Um, but the lessons that I would, the main lesson I would take away from the Cold War for for the moment today, is let's not forget that diplomacy worked during the Cold War, even amidst the the deeply adversarial dynamic that exists between the United States and Soviet Union. Diplomacy allowed us to avoid nuclear Armageddon. It allowed us to take problems off the table. Uh, you know, if you look at the range of agreements that were were established, the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the the Chemical Weapons Convention, like these are real problems uh, that that the United States and Soviet Union were able to untangle together through intense, uh, clear-eyed diplomacy with each other. We also were able to recognize that it's possible for competitors to cooperate uh, when it serves our interests to do so. 
And so, you know, the United States and, and the Soviet Union helped come together to eradicate smallpox at the height of the Cold War. And so I guess that's some of the, the inspiration or, or lessons that I would take away from that experience. Yeah, that's very, very good points. Um, I promised Ryan that I would get back to Taiwan when you had mentioned that very early on in your in your conversation, but I wanted to cover the the, the broader context of your book. And so now I want to turn to Taiwan and uh, with the remaining time that we have. And I, I want to focus on on the logic of the deterrence, because this is one, this is, I think, a central uh, point that you make with regards to your coverage of Taiwan in in, in the book, uh, and, and, and feel free to, to disagree that there are more central themes and how you want to, uh, how you frame Taiwan in the overall context of your, of your thesis. Um, but you, but I like how you, um, how you apply the logic of deterrence, but you also mentioned that there are qualifications. So you sort of, there, there are some, you know, qualifications there and I, and I want you to sort of be able to, um, you know, help elaborate on that for, for, for our audience, uh, because I think that sort of. You know, helps um, that really sort of captures the the message that uh, that that you, how you see the uh, Taiwan fitting into this uh, into this framework. Well, one of the the points that I try to make in the book, Russell, is that the United States, the people of the United States, have a very deep sympathy and sense of support for our friends in Taiwan, uh, and and that's really a, a starting point for us to think about uh, a lot of these issues. Um, the United States also sees the the strong strategic value of our close partnership with Taiwan for us and for our allies and partners uh, in Asia. Um, and, you know, American strategy for many decades has been oriented around um, trying to preserve peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, our goal is to try to keep a, a path available uh, to, to leaders on both sides of the Taiwan Strait to resolve their differences peacefully if it ever becomes possible. Mm -hmm. um, but this requires the United States to do hard things. We, we have to stand in the, the way of the two paths that could lead us to a conflict, uh, either, you know, Taiwan moving towards de jure independence or China launching an invasion to forcibly annex uh, uh, Taiwan. But the, the, you know, the more proximate concern, I think, for all of us in this moment today is to make sure that we have the capacity to continue to deter uh, China from feeling confident that they could achieve their military or their political objectives through military force. Uh, and that's going to require the United States uh, and its partners to maintain a, a visible, credible deterrent capacity, uh, uh, as well as uh, clear resolve to, to exercise it. And it's also going to you know, require Taiwan to continue doing the hard work that it's doing to strengthen its own uh, defensive capacity as well. So I want to go into that, you know, excellent points there. And I, I think, you know, I want to dive into this sort of the, the more proximate scenario that that you had highlighted, which is, you know, and we've been hearing a lot from, you know, um, uh, from military officials uh, and uh, defense experts uh, about really a, a timeline, um, you know, sort of a, a, a timeline for uh, for China uh, to to invade. Uh, Taiwan uh, to include, of course, the uh, former Admiral, uh, I mean, Admiral um, Davidson, the former commander of indo uh indicating um, last year that uh, China could um, you know, invade by 2027, um, as well as uh, even, you know, Taiwan's defense minister at one point uh, mentioned that he thinks that uh, China would have the capabilities to invade, um, you know, uh, by 2025. What is your assessment then of the sort of the imminence of the uh, of the threat of of China's invasion of Taiwan, as well as to what you know, and, and the urgency of the issues um, uh, of the of the issues at hand. Well, this is, I mean, it's such an important question, um, and I'm glad that we are having a chance to to bat around ideas about it. I I take very seriously uh, the risk that Taiwan faces. Uh, I think it's real. And, and we absolutely have to do everything possible to prevent, uh, you know, the, the nightmare scenario from occurring. My own experience um, watching President Xi and being in meetings with him uh, is that, that it would be uncharacteristic of him to commit to a timeline uh, for military action against Taiwan. 
President President Xi's modus operandi is to preserve as much decision decision space and and flexibility as he can um, for for any course of action that he pursues. Uh, and so it it would surprise me if internally uh, he or others have committed to uh, a a timeline, but we can't rule out the possibility that they have. My my own sense is that uh, that the risks will probably and the decisions will probably be more concision de, uh, conditions based than timeline based, and the conditions I think that would compel uh, China in the direction of exercising military force against Taiwan would be on one end if they felt that uh, that all hope was lost that there was no available path peacefully to achieving their political obje objectives with Taiwan that Taiwan had either declared independence or moved so far away from the mainland uh, that uh, that they couldn't could no longer envision a scenario in which uh, in which they could accomplish their objectives through anything short of military force. That's one end. The, the other scenario is if China's leaders conclude that they can achieve their military objectives with speed and minimal costs um, towards Taiwan. In other words, it becomes a ripe opportunity for them uh, to to annex Taiwan by force. It's, I think it's the job of you know, U.S. policymakers to avoid either of those scenarios from appearing uh, to, to carry the day. And I think that we can. I, I remain confident that, uh, that the United States and Taiwan are capable of that. Um, but we're going to have to have you know, some clarity of purpose and, and some consistency and predictability and, and, uh, and principle to guide us forward. I think an important point that you make in, um, you know, throughout this discussion and also in your book is just the, uh, in terms of one of the, uh, uh, I think, interest of the United States in in uh, in cross strait relations is is the ability to preserve the ability for the United States to exercise influence in in cross strait de developments, uh, and I would like to sort of you know get you to sort of uh, talk a bit about about how has U.S. influence affected cross strait developments in the past, and and what you think is the right balance uh, going forward, and and I will weave into this question. You know the the the, the really uh, I think unprecedented uh, debates going on in the in the think tank community, at the very least, with regards to uh, the need to shift from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity, and you know make an explicit commitment to come to Taiwan's defense in the event of a Chinese invasion. So, you know, can you just talk about in terms of how you see? How has U.S. influence affected cross-strait developments in the past, and how do you, what do you think is the, you know, the, the right balance going forward? Uh, I think that the United States plays a. I mean, my my assumption is the United States plays a pretty significant role in in cross-strait relations, and we should just accept that. Uh, and it's to our benefit to have the ability to influence uh, events in the Taiwan Strait. Um, I, I'm surprised sometimes when I hear. Uh, people suggest that uh, the cross-strait dynamics are exclusively a, a China-Taiwan affair and, and the United States is sort of a, a bystander. Uh, that doesn't reflect my own experiences or, or my own evaluation or analysis of the situation. I think that, that, that our actions have significant effect uh, of perceptions both in Taiwan and in China about the nature of the cross-strait relationship. Um, on, on your latter question, uh, about strategic ambiguity and strategic clarity, you know, I guess the way that I think about it is what problem are we trying to solve? Um, are, are we uncertain that, uh, that China respects the, the, the credibility of our security support for, for Taiwan? Um, I, my sense is that uh, Beijing assumes that the United States will intervene in a cross-strait conflict. They have to. It would be uh, negligent for them to assume anything otherwise, and they have to plan uh, based upon that assumption. And so um, that's that's a healthy place for us to be. And uh, my my preference would be for the United States to have a steady, principled, predictable posture towards developments in the Taiwan Strait that is guided by our fundamental interest in upholding uh, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. That's the objective uh, of American policy. So I think that we can probably take some inspiration from Teddy Roosevelt. You know, he talked about speaking softly and carrying a big stick. That's a good place for us to be uh, in in terms of protecting our interests and those of our friends in Taiwan. 
I, I, I definitely want to turn to some of our audience questions, uh, but before I do, and I, again, I want to remind our audience members that uh, you may submit your questions to contact at globaltaiwan.org, where you use the chat function uh, on uh, the uh, on the YouTube page. Um, and please include your name and affiliation. Those that do will be prioritized in the line of questioning. And so my last final question for you, um, Ryan, uh, it, and this relates to to Taiwan here, and I want to conclude with the with the Taiwan questions because you also focus in your you know your your book on while it's primarily focused on U.S. China relations, it's also about U.S. allies and partners, and you thread that through uh, your 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 our conversation here. And so I want to ask you what you think then are the role of U.S. allies and specifically the role of Japan. Um, uh, and I would, you know, and then given the, I think the issues with, with Ukraine, let's throw transatlantic cooperation there, um, you know, on, on, on China policy and, and, and over, over Taiwan as well. Yeah, I thank you for asking Russell. I think that Japan is America's most important ally and the most important region of the world for the future of the United States. Uh, this relationship is just absolutely essential, uh, for America's ability to protect and advance its interest in, in Asia. Uh, there is no substitute for it. And so uh, I, I, I think that it, it plays an important role in allowing the United States to project power in Asia and, and also to have a strong partner, uh, both one that can provide honest counsel to the United States when we need it uh, about uh, our, our presence and our approach to the region, but that also can, can sort of walk alongside of us and have immense capacity to advance uh, our shared interest and our shared vision in the region. I think it's also good for Japan. Uh, you know, the Japan's relationship with the United States provides a firm footing for it to, to deal with China from, uh, you know, a position of greater strength. And, you know, we're talking about Taiwan. I think that for Japan, Taiwan and South Korea are essential buffers uh, for them and for their sense of security in the region. And on, on transatlantic issues, um, we will see uh, tomorrow uh, the the China EU summit. Uh, I think it'll be an important moment uh, to to determine if if the EU is capable of delivering a unified, strong, clear message uh, to the Chinese leadership about their expectations of the role that China will play in the unfolding uh, calamity and tragedy in Ukraine today. Excellent. Okay, um, so turning to now to the audience question. The first one is from uh, Stephen Smith. Um, now, the question is, does your view of America's relative superior strength take into account what has been described as the, quote, myth of American exceptionalism, end quote? Question. Yeah, That's well, the question. Thank, thank you to the question from Steve. Look, I... Um, it's we we live in the United States where we broadcast uh, our foibles and our mistakes to the world on a daily basis, and so it's I think it's much easier for us to see our own shortcomings and missteps than it is for us to see some of China's. But if we take a step back from the day to day reality and sort of try to take a big picture view of uh, of the relationship, the reality is that uh, you know the United States has real inherent advantages. Um, we have a culture that attracts the best and brightest minds from around the world to want to come live and work here. Uh, we have the world's best university system, benign borders, the world's reserve currency, uh, and the, the strongest alliance network in the history of humanity. There's no other country in human history that has built the type of architecture around the world that the United States enjoys. Uh, China enjoys none of those attributes. Uh, and I, one of the things that I've been most struck by in researching this book is that China does have significant abundant strengths, uh, but it also has real vulnerabilities and challenges. Uh, China's profile is a, a country with rising debt, a declining workforce population, and flat productivity. Uh, I can't think of many examples in, in modern economic history where countries with that profile have been able to sustain uh, significant growth for prolonged periods of time. Okay, next question is from Adrian, um, and I'm going to uh, condense this a bit uh, to focus. What are some areas of po potential cooperation, um, specifically with regards to the United Nations, 
uh, considering uh, that the UN has been a platform where the US and China are have been, you know, competing for influence. So I think this brought a question about, you know, cooperation. Can we do that in the in 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 the you do at the UN? Uh, where you know, I think uh, Beijing has been really wielding its influence there in 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 in, in many you know negative ways. I would I would say, um, Ryan, over you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's an important question. Um, I think that there are uh, opportunities for for the United States and China to find common ground and to coordinate, if not cooperate, uh, their respective actions. As as we talked about earlier, I think it'll be easier under the umbrella of multilateral organizations for both countries to to move in a shared direction than it will be for us to try to pull China into supporting an American initiative or vice versa. Um, Specific issues, you know, climate is often an issue that's raised by by people. Um, we have a, a shared interest in uh, managing Iran's uh, nuclear uh, aspirations. We have a shared interest in uh, in limiting uh, global economic volatility, in encouraging sustainable development, and dealing with the the refugee crisis that will spill throughout Europe. Um, so. Uh, it's it's hard in the current moment because the, the the relationship is so fraught to see where those areas of cooperation are. Uh, I don't think that there's going to be any major near term moves uh, between the United States and China to to step in that direction. Uh, but I hope that as time goes by, uh, you know, cool headedness will allow us to see uh, where it would serve our benefit uh, to have that type of coordination with China in the future. Okay. This question from David: um, While recognizing the shortcomings of the trade war. But also China's efforts to localize supply chains and in key industries. Are there any critical industries that the U.S. should try to shift away from China to maintain its broader competitive advantage? Yeah, I, I think that you know one of the the lessons of the COVID era uh, was that it is dangerous to have over reliance upon a single market, including China, uh, for critical components. And so, you know, medical devices, medical equipment, um, precursors for pharmaceuticals, um, and then the the broader issue of sort of the tech stack and and the role of semiconductors. A lot of that production, as we know, takes place outside of China, not inside China. Um, but these are these are the types of sectors that I think it's it's entirely reasonable for the United States to be very vigilant about ensuring supply chain security over. Question from Girmantes Lailari. What does uh, Mr. Haas think the U.S. would do if the PLA conducted a complete blockade of all air and sea traffic in and out of Taiwan? That's a difficult military question there. It is. Uh, it's too bad that uh, Bridge Colby's not with us to help us, <laughs> right. us through that. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a real concern. It's something that we should think about. Uh, I've looked at some of the modeling that's been done about it, and and I think that China also has its own vulnerabilities in that type of scenario. Um, yeah, you know, the United States has pretty significant undersea warfare capabilities, but the the PLA also is dependent upon uh, imports for fuel and oil, and the PLA's ability to project power uh, fades the further that we get from China's shores. A lot of uh, the imports upon which China relies transit uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, where the United States has the capacity to have a very strong presence. And so um, I, I think that uh, if we're going to have a serious examination of a blockade scenario, we need to not just look at the immediate periphery of Taiwan, but the, the broader environment in which uh, these, these uh, action reaction events would, would take place. We have time for one last question, and I'll take this one from, from Zoe. Um, what do you think is the real risk of China's economic coercion and all that of, of Taiwan? Should the U.S. be prioritizing measures to counter uh, China's coercion of Taiwan and Taiwan's strategic partners through trade and other economic measures? Well, I, Russell, as a general proposition, I think it is in America's interest to ensure Taiwan's capacity to have a diversity of uh, of trade and economic relationships with partners around the world and to not feel uh, over dependent upon China uh, for their future economic growth. I would like uh, for the United States and Taiwan to make progress in, in their um, economic relationship. I think that's been the, 
the slow, the sort of the slow leg of uh, of this race. Um, our, our security, our diplomatic, our political relationships have sort of outpaced uh, the rate of progress of our economic relationship. And I, I would like for uh, the economic relationship to catch up uh, going forward, because the, the more that uh, Taiwan has diversity of economic relationships, the more secure and confident they will feel. And it's in America's interest for Taiwan to feel secure and confident. Well, that brings us perfectly up to our time at 10 a.m., um, thank you so very much, Ryan, for for spending your morning with us and sharing your, you know, really again thoughtful and candid views uh, about uh, U.S.-China relations, about competitive interdependence, the role of Taiwan uh, as well. And uh, and I just want to say that you know I think this is a a, a, a really an excellent uh, discussion, and I'm really pleased that we were able to to uh, to, to do this. And so to our audience members. Um, if you haven't already gotten a copy of uh, Ryan's book, here it is. Um, and um, and please uh, make sure to go and purchase a copy because our discussion really just um, really just scratches the surface in terms of the details and and analysis uh, that Ryan provides uh, uh, in his um, in his very again um, uh, thoughtful framing of the of the issues. So so thank you again, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russell. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you.